I guess we ought to get started. Um, welcome everybody to our August training and technical technical training meeting. Um, I uh, wanted to apologize to everybody. Normally I send out a reminder a week in advance and I did not get that done this time. So I hope uh, anybody in your office who got the uh, notification late, I hope I didn't mess them up too badly. I apologize, but. Um, and so this is our agenda for today. The format's very much the same as uh, all of our other meetings, but I guess before I get into that, I just wanted to let everybody know, Brad Carpenter did retire yesterday. Yesterday was his last day. Uh, just wanted to thank everybody for all of the the congratulations and well wishes that you sent to him. Um, I We do have his personal contact info if you ever need it going forward. But yeah, Bo Lander asked a minute ago how that, how that went and I felt like it went really well. I feel like Brad was very, I, I hope it was a good day for him. He asked us to not, he did not want a retirement party. He did not want to make a big deal out of things. He seemed very content and happy with his decision and his ability to retire when he wanted to retire. So anyway, we'll miss him. The, um, I assume most everybody knows, but they have asked me to manage the program going forward. So, uh, so we'll, Hopefully, just carry on without too many uh, uh, bumps in the road, and we'll keep doing what we do so that we can run the program and help you guys out in any way we can. So, any questions about that at all? Awesome. Well, so like we always do, we cover a couple of training opportunities. We have a little bit of new business. Um, I think you'll hear from each of the state staff today in uh, some form or another. And then our main topic for the meeting today is, is uh, we've been calling it a technical monitoring review and preview. We've done this, I think three times in the past during the month of August. Uh, so it seems to have been uh, helpful to folks, but basically what we'll do is we'll talk about the Kind of a summary of what we found during the monitoring for the last year and and then based on that kind of what we will be looking for during this year's monitoring or what we'll be watching closely i guess so anyway so let's go ahead and get started with that um the under the training opportunities <clears throat> We do have an Energy Otter 101 class scheduled in September. It's the, this is the class where we spend four full days going into detail on how to run an energy audit. So uh, if you need this class, the prerequisite for the class is that you must have run at least one full energy audit before you come to the class. We, we do take a very deep dive, but we don't, necessarily start at step one we start at step two or three so if you have never run an energy audit you will be lost and so that's why we require that you spend some time doing that um, for those who are registered planning to come if you know make sure that you have plans to complete your energy audit before you come to the class uh, we typically reach out a week before to verify that you've completed that so Make, plan accordingly, please. Um, but we do, I know Justin put out, sent out an email and the, the date in the email has passed. So officially registration should have closed already, but uh, we decided yesterday that that it we could leave it open through today. So if you uh, would like to register for that class, you must reach out to Justin today. After today, we can't add any more people. We just need to set a deadline so we can uh, do the paperwork to provide meals and things like that. So any questions on that class? All right. 
And then the other training opportunities I have listed there are, I don't know much about them other than their, their national trainings. I, I've been to some of them and stuff, but if you want more details on them, you'll need, you'll need to do a Google search. So I'm aware that NASCASP is doing a conference in September and NCAP's doing a conference in August. It's probably a little too late to do paperwork for that one, but um, a reminder to everybody, if you are planning on attending any conferences that are out of state, you must receive written permission from me before you can uh, proceed with that. So anyway, let me know if, uh, you know, talk to your coordinators about that kind of stuff and, and then make sure that they reach out to me for that approval. All right, any questions on that or any other trainings that anybody's aware of that would be helpful for this group before we move on? Uh, can I just ask a question for those of us with contractors licenses that are due this year? Um, we have our three hours live under our belt, but I'm having a hard time finding a good three hour HVAC specific course. So if anybody out there has one or has taken one, please send me a link if something worthwhile. I'll send you something, Scott. Will you CC me? Because I have the same problem. Thanks, Jesse. <clears throat> yep. Cool. Yeah. And the, yeah. Thanks for the reminder. This is an uh, is an odd year. Yeah. And so renewals are due by is it October or November of this year for any of your anybody that's holding a contractor license. This is the year. Cool. Um, so new business, Justin. You got a something for us here good morning everyone so today we figure we'll try something different just to get the juices flowing get the engagement going and to focus on safety so what this segment is is spot the hazard and i try to find a picture that was very common to what we typically see in clients homes <laughs> it's but yeah so with this, we'll just spot the hazards, get the engagement. We'll start up with Bragg and work our way down south. So if the coordinators from each of the agencies start with Bragg can just call out a hazard that you can spot. We'll start with uh, Jesse. Um, open medicine cabinet. Okay, Yuka. Anybody from Yuka? Uh, yeah, I don't know if Angie's on or not. You might have to. Pick on one of her team. Who's on? That? We'll what about you. Isaac or Ricardo? Or I, I noticed a couple new names too. If you guys are from Yucca, feel free to speak up. There's no handrail on the stairs. Okay, now we'll do you in a baker? Are you in a baker? You can dial all the cords on the floor. Bless your heart. Six County? Bless your heart. Anyone from there? Uh, yeah, cigarettes. Good job, Mike. Southeastern. Uh, the space heater has a shirt on it. There you go. Good job, Chris. Five County. Uh, the loose rugs on the floor in the rug corners. Okay, and I guess the best for last that I missed, Mag. I didn't see Jake on there either, so anybody from Mag? Yeah, I see Burl or Jaden. Oh, yeah. Or Osvaldo. Did anybody say the stuff on the stairway, the trip hazards? <clears throat> nope, good job. So the idea of this is really just get the engagement going and just really focus in on hazards in the home. Although they might not be severe as a construction site, they can still be impactful. And not only for the sake of our safety, but also the homeowners, if we can try just to educate them the best we can. I know it's like pulling teeth. We'll just spot things out to them, let them know. But this can be a serious hazard and it's cliche to say you know we all have a uh, family at home waiting for us to come home so let's just you know stop and think about it if you're unsure or if you don't have the correct ppe it only takes a couple minutes to go get the right ppe 
And with that being said, for now, I just want to do something a little elementary with spot the hazards, but eventually I want to get to a point where it's an actual photo of something that is wrong or somebody that a contractor installed that was wrong or collectively what we can do and talk about it to what measure should be installed to correct it. And with that being said, let's spot the hazards. I feel like it needs some music or something, you know, to start it off or and kind of to play you off. It should. It, you don't it, have to work on that. This is just, you know, it's a rough engine. This is the first yeah. time. Yeah. It's the Jeopardy theme song. Uh, <laughs> All right, thanks, guys. Awesome. And then I think next we had. Uh, I think Kaya was next. Kaya. That's me. Um, okay, so I'm just doing an update for the new uh, auditing tool that we have that's now online. So we've talked about it a little bit um, before, but we've had a beta team helping us out um, to figure out what all of the issues are with it and kind of troubleshoot to make sure that, that we're ready to turn over. And so today, if you are doing any auditing, i.e. like picking up um, or field collecting today, you are expected to then run that in the new audit. So starting today, if you are starting any new field collections, you will be expected that that house, house that you are field collecting for will be ran in the new audit. So we will be looking for that through monitoring. So just make sure um that you're auditing in the right auditing tool moving forward and if you have any questions auditing um give me a call send me an email all the things um and we can kind of work through any issues that you're having um our beta team members they we are ha having them act as the lead auditor so please if any of the other auditors that weren't in the beta team meetings, um, if you have questions or having issues, go to your lead auditor first. And then um, if they're not able to help, then um, you can give me a call um, or I'll have the auditor give me a call, the lead auditor give me a call. Um, and then I was gonna say, oh, we have a meeting after this, um, our beta team meeting, just to kind of review some of the changes. Um, that we were able to get right before this so that it makes auditing a little bit better um yes so jonathan um the audits that up to today <laughs> all other audits are expected to be in the older version um so I believe Turner will be sending out a program notice or Hardy has. <laughs> um, I will today. Okay, yeah. And then um, if there's any other guidance changes, then um, we will let you know. Um, but we're all kind of learning as we're going. So do keep some communication open with us if you're having issues because we, we understand. So just let us know. What's up? Any other questions? Cool, thanks. You can add anything you want, Turner, to that. <laughs> it, it feels anticlimactic that this is something that, uh, that the program's been waiting for for years and years yeah. and years. Today's the day. Yeah. Yay. I hope it's not uh, yay. <laughs> I hope it's not too bumpy. But yeah, any audits from before? It's kind of like we're kind of like a new setup library. We're drawing line in the sand. From today forward, any audit that has a work start date of August 1st or thereafter must be audited with the new audit. So it's been a long time coming, huh? Yeah. Several years. It has, it has. So there's still ironing out a few little little uh kinks and stuff, but I I think overall it's gonna be good. So thanks, Kaya. And then Nicole. Have you got something for us as well? Hi guys. Oops, sorry. sorry, sorry. I have to mute Kaya. We share an office, so <laughs> technical difficulties. 
Um, so we've had RMP come back and they are going to be tracking some things that uh, we weren't before. So this is for anyone of you who are currently or will be completing BWRs. Um, and it's specifically on the ones that have an RMP rebate attached to them in two specific scenarios. So this page that you're looking at right here does come directly from my BWR guide. Um, I hope you guys are using it. Um, I hope you're liking it. If you are using it and you see anything that's lacking or any issues with it, please reach out to me and let me know. I want to refine it. I want to make BWRs easier for you guys to be using or to be doing. Uh, and if you're not using it, please do, <laughs> especially if you've been doing BWRs for a long time. Uh, I think it happens to all of us. We we get a little bit complacent, think that we know what we're doing, and sometimes we just need a refresher on things. And we're finding just a lot of little little things that we're having to go in and change. So if we can just you know kind of help the process along, and I would really like to know if this is something that's helpful or not. So especially those who are new to BWRs, this is a great tool. But even you guys that have been doing it a long time. I want to know if it's a great tool. So, and I think that you guys are the ones that could give me more information on that. So back to the subject at hand, I got a little off track there. The RMP rebates. So they are going to be tracking um, the AC type now on two specific scenarios. So if you're claiming an attic insulation uh, or doing a crisis cooling, they want to specifically know some information on the attic insulation. This is page 12, by the way, of the RMP guide. On the attic insulation, um, they want to know one of those five categories. Which one is it? Is it just essential AC? Is there electric heat with it? Um, and what I need you to do is put that in the comment section specifically of the rebate part of the BWR. Um, the reason for that being is the information that I send to RMP does not include that the regular BWR, that first part that has the comment on it. I'm only sending them the information on the rebates. So they can't see your comments um, from the regular BWR. I need it specifically on the rebate. So I'm sure you've noticed that there's two comment boxes. We haven't been really, I think most people don't use the comment box on the RMP uh, got, or part of the BWR, but that's where I'm going to need you to put it. So again, for the attic insulation, they want to know one of those five types. You just type one of those in. And then crisis cooling, they're asking for just a little bit more information. They want to know um, what, what it was replaced with. What, what the system was before and what it was replaced with to know that it was an increase in energy efficiency. So I have the example there um, of the SEER rating. So that's basically it. And it is just those two scenarios currently. Um, but if you have any questions, let me know. Again, please use the guide. Give me feedback on the guide. Let me know if it's helpful, if it's not helpful, if something needs to be added to it. But yeah. That's it. Excellent. Does anybody have any questions about this? Cool. And I, apologies that we kind of have to ask you to add stuff to the comments. Our the reporting system we have is just not nimble enough for us to make changes like this on the fly. We may run this one up the flagpole and see if we can have a field or two added, but. Uh, we get a lot of pushback there. So anyway, so thank you for your efforts in doing this. Thanks, Nicole. Awesome. Uh, let's move on to our main topic for today. And Rogers, go ahead and take it away, man. All right. Uh, in our monitoring, as you've all experienced in the past, Turner and Dalton have brought up their top five issues that they've noticed. Uh, this year for the QCI in production, these are the top five. Uh, infiltration reduction, we did have a 42% accuracy rate as far as the job, the jobs that met the reduction goal. 
and the overall reduction average across the monitoring sample was 29 percent uh number two was work meets standards uh the four most systematic issues that showed up this year this past year were uh, water heater blanket installation issues uh, some of that included the top of electric water heater tanks not being insulated or the blanket itself not being secured uh, duct insulation not being properly secured vapor barriers not being completely sealed that could be where it's supposed to be sealed to the foundation or just a hole cut in the actual vapor barrier in some in some places and door weather stripping installed incorrectly uh, if you need training on any of these products that you guys have and you don't have anybody experienced in your agency it's fine to reach out and we can show you how to do installation of, of a lot of these products. Number three was BWR and material accuracy. Three of the seven agencies had discrepancies between the BWR and the job cost by measure or client completion report showing different dollar amounts. Number four was uh, with the work orders. Five of the seven agencies had issues with either a measure that was on a work order that was not matching up with the recommended measures report, or the other issue was the air sealing strategy on the, or on the work orders were not being followed. And number five, this is a, a low risk item to the program, but the purpose of this one, uh, in progress photo documentation, is to uh, is so your QCI and or the state when we're monitoring can avoid diminishing the effectiveness of a measure just to verify it was completed or done correctly. So for example, if we have to go dig it through an attic or flatten out the attic insulation just to verify that top plate was done, that's diminishing the, the effectiveness of that added insulation. Is there any questions on any of those five? I got a question. Uh -oh. I, I feel like you've stated it already, but maybe just to, for clarification. So talk about number one a little bit more. So what when you say the accuracy rate of the infiltration reduction, what does that mean? Yeah, sorry, my apologies. 42% meaning 42% of the jobs that we monitored met the infiltration reduction goal. So they got like the 30% or the 50% reduction, whichever was applicable? Correct. Gotcha. And then overall, you said that, that on average, our overall for the monitoring sample that we had was 29% reduction. Gotcha. Okay. Anybody have any other questions on it? All right. Well, if you want, you can advance the slide and I'll talk yes. about what we yes, saw sorry. on the energy audit side of things. So <clears throat> this was what, what I found uh, for on the energy audit side of things. Um, and just same thing, I put together the top five. Um, the number one item was actually the same as it was last year. It, it is lead or it's issues with lead. So uh, the, this top five, remember, is specific to energy audits. So this is what, in, you know, if you, if you are an energy auditor, if you're, if you're an energy auditor in training, please pay close attention to this stuff because uh, we will be working this year to be training and trying to improve 
where we're at with this. But so when it comes to lead, the guidance is that we need to be testing all disturbed, all, all, dis, all painted surfaces that will be disturbed must be tested in homes that are pre-78. And what I found on my monitoring was uh, that uh, there were four agencies that had an issue or two. So there were six homes where they either did not lead test something that was disturbed and it was a pre-78 home or something changed during the process. And, uh, you know, like the, the surface that the auditor thought was going to be disturbed was tested, but then something happened during production where they disturbed a different surface that wasn't tested. So this one, as you can look down my list, you can see the error rate. You'll notice that this one had a lower error rate. The reason why it's number one is because of the risk to the program. Uh, we treat lead and asbestos very seriously. If it, if it poses a risk to you guys or to the client, we want to make sure we get this right. And we really, we don't have room for error on lead. Um, but I, we had a 16% error rate of, of the, of all the files that I went through, 16% of them had an issue with lead. And those issues led to one finding for an agency and three areas of concern for other agencies. Um, anyway, so that's something we will be working on this in the coming year. Uh, we may provide a little additional training and clarification on that. Uh, but does anybody have any questions about lead or lead testing? All right. Number two item was uh, health and safety assessment errors. And the error rate on this one was, was high. And this is an item that has not been our, on our, really hasn't been on this list before. Uh, last year, there was, we were having trouble with a certain aspect of our health and safety assessment. Uh, and I feel like this new form that we've been using has fixed that. Uh, we were having trouble documenting when a client had a pre-existing condition that, that our efforts might exacerbate. Uh, but I feel like across the board with the new form, everybody was able to document those very well. And I feel like we fixed that error or that issue. But with the new form, a new issue has come up. And that is that auditors are not completing the form. That's really all this is. It, uh, the form is structured in a way that as an energy auditor, you must check something in every section of the form. Basically, if, if you read the form and look at it, if you, don't, uh, if you don't check off a box in one of those sections, either to indicate that there was no problem or that there was a problem and, and this is what it was, by leaving it blank, you've now documented that you didn't check anything in that area. And so most of these were just simply an auditor got to a section a lot of times they were just not applicable, but they didn't, they didn't tick a little box. So the ask on this one is simple, complete the form. Make sure you put a checkbox in every section of that form and that should solve this problem. But it had a high enough error rate, six agencies, 13 jobs, 44% error rate. It made number two on the list, so. Uh, any questions on that one? All right. Number three is one I we're going to have to have some additional training on. Uh, there were a handful of issues with ASHRAE compliance this year, and I feel like we've taken a step or two backward on ASHRAE. I don't know if, um, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm going to have to spend a little more time on this, and we'll... we'll We'll prepare some stuff and, and hopefully provide some better training going forward. But we had issues with ASHRAE where there were just minor issues on the calculator where somebody got the building height wrong or, um, 
you know, we've got the wrong number of bedrooms or bathrooms. And those details are important when you're calculating ASHRAE. But we also ended up on uh, this year's monitoring, I found three houses that did not meet ASHRAE compliance when the agency was done. And we had to ask those agencies to go back and make sure that the house met ASHRAE compliance because that's a requirement from DOE. DOE says if you turn in a weatherization completion, that house must meet ASHRAE. So if I go out on a monitoring and find that it does not, I have no choice but to send you back and make sure that it does. Uh, a couple of, I'm trying to remember the, the issues. There was, there was a home where the, they installed an HRV because they, they had some exposed dirt in the crawl space. They installed an HRV, but the HRV only provided half of the ventilation that it should have. And so they didn't, they didn't have enough continuous ventilation on the HRV. Uh, there was a, I think there was a similar situation where there wasn't quite enough ventilation and they, they didn't, the auditor didn't even think to cover the dirt so that in that home, oh, that's what it was. They, they used an existing fan, which um, they had not verified that it met ASHRAE compliance. And by that, I mean that the fan, uh, there was no, there was no rating on the fan to say that this fan was at, at 100 CFM or at 50 CFM or whatever they had it running at was going to be below one zone in sound. And that's basically, in general, you can't use an existing fan unless you have that documentation. If you, if you happen across a fan, a Panasonic or a Newtone or something, and, and you had the documentation showing that this particular model actually does meet the zone rating, you could use it. But I think that's rare. Like it's, I've never seen it happen yet. So you really shouldn't be using existing fans and turning them into whole building ventilation systems. You really should be installing a new one. So we had an issue or two with that. And then also on one of those homes where we had that issue, they, they turned an existing fan into a whole building ventilation system. And they also, so as, as an exhaust system, sorry, they also left some exposed dirt in a crawl space which is a no-no. If you have exposed dirt in a crawl space, you have to have a, uh, you have to use a balanced system or a positive system. So you have to do makeup air or an HRV. So anyway, auditors, you need to watch very closely, make sure you're getting your ASHRAE strategies right. Uh, but at the state level, we'll be taking a look to see if there's anything we can do to help, to help with that, to help you think through those strategies a little better. It'll probably, just look like some training, but if we, if anybody has any other ideas on how we can improve the process, let us know. Uh, but seven agencies, so every single agency had one or more issues with ASHRAE. There were 11 jobs where we found issues and at a 34% error rate. Questions on ASHRAE? All right. Uh, HVAC evaluations has been on the list for a little while. I think I have another slide in a second. With uh, I think we improved in this area, but we're still we still have a high error rate, so we we still have room to improve. And this one is um, it's it's the little details. It's making sure that we're clearly identifying the pre-existing HVAC system, the sear rating on it, um, you know the the uh, efficiency rating making sure we have the right combustion tapes and things like that for on the pre-existing stuff. And then also making sure that we're getting the post uh, data on whatever we are installing correct. But there was issues, they seem minor, but they, they do add up. They do become issues. Uh, sometimes they cause sizing errors and things like that. Um, again, on our last technical monitoring, DOE called us out on a handful of HVAC errors. So I, I felt like that was a good reminder from DOE on how important it is for us to get these details right. But six agencies had issues, nine jobs, 20, 28% error rate. Uh, and then air sealing. 
um, came in at number five. So uh, this one made the list probably because I, as a monitor, was focusing on uh, on whether or not auditors were using their zonals to develop their air sealing strategy. And that, that was something I called out on uh, a handful of jobs this year. There were also a number of jobs where I, I just, I wasn't sure. I, it kind of felt like they really weren't using their zonals, but I, there wasn't enough data there and I didn't want to call them out on it. But, but auditors, uh, you guys do a fantastic job of, of taking the zonals, measuring the zonals. Um, you need to make sure that you're also looking at that data and developing the air sealing strategy based off of that data. So there's there's really two things that you need to be doing when you sit down to write your air sealing strategy. You need to be looking at your zonals and thinking about how wh where the leakage is, and then you're also using the air sealing prioritization list, and you use those two tools together to figure out where am I going to invest this money in air sealing in the home? Uh, so anyway that was one i was watching closely on there i i think it uh, it wasn't as broad across all of the agencies there were three agencies that really struggled with this and we had a 25 percent error rate on you know at, when i looked at the average of all the jobs so you can see there was kind of a higher error rate at three agencies on that but so with these top five issues there i actually i have a top 10 list but um I don't want people to get lost on stuff. So we're really gonna try and focus on these five with the energy audit uh, in, in our efforts this year. These will be things that as my team goes out and monitors this year, they will be watching these very closely. Uh, I, I'm not adding anything to the monitoring tool because all of these things are already there. there this was nothing new uh, to the monitoring tool, um, but we'll be watching this closely. We'll be using some of the technical training meetings, and then we'll also uh, be using our, I guess now's a good time to talk about training. Um, I had We had hoped to be able to provide a fall training, but we, we have, we're going to kick that into spring. We are going to do a spring training, but with the new audit and with the change uh, in leadership, we have a few too many things going on to be able to pull off an, a good fall training. But we're planning on doing uh, spring training. We'll give you guys more information as we move forward. Uh, but we'd like to have the network be able to come up to the training center and spend a little time together this spring. So during that, we'll also probably be covering some of these issues as well to hopefully see some improvement there. Does anybody have any questions on anything on this slide or anything about our training efforts? Hey, Matt, could you tell me where to find the ASHRAE compliance standards to help refresh my memory? Oh, thank you. That's a great question. So uh, the ASHRAE uh, organization does not provide their standard for free. You have to buy it. And it's, it's only $75. Uh, each of your agencies should purchase at least one copy. You're welcome to purchase a copy for every auditor or for every auditor and every QCI. Uh, so if you just, if you go, if you just search ASHRAE and go to their, I think it's a .org, go to their website and then you need to look up, it's the 62.2 standard. And there's a 2016 and there's a 2019 standard. I I don't, if they want you to purchase both of them, then you are looking for the 2016 standard. Our, our program is going to stick with the 2016 standard until we are forced to do otherwise. They added a few weird things to the 2019 standard that we don't love. And DOE has given us the latitude to not, we don't have to adopt the 2019 standard. So, so ASHRAE, I think it's ASHRAE something.org and then you're looking for the 62.2 standard and it should run you about 75 to $100. Uh, be careful, you'll notice when you do download it, it actually has your name or your email address right on there as, a, as part of their copyright. So 
you don't want to uh, be posting that anywhere where somebody can get it because they're pretty serious about keeping their stuff protected. But I feel like it's a little bit of a roadblock because I don't know how many of you guys on this call have purchased that and have read from it. That's what I was afraid of. <laughs> so I, I have tried over the years to, to uh, provide training on it um, because I know there's a little bit of a hesitancy to purchase it. Please purchase it. Please get a copy for each agency. Uh, and then make sure that your staff know, you know, put it on a shared drive and make sure your staff know where it's at. It's the, the, the meat in that sandwich is about three pages long. If you're an auditor, if you would just sit down the next time you're calculating ASHRAE and just read that and try to apply it to that one job, you'll learn more than I could teach you in, in three days worth of class. So thanks for the question, Oswaldo. Yeah, thank you. Uh, any other questions on it? Uh, if you can hear me, uh, regarding the ASHRAE, are we going to look more and find a better way to actually measure those ERVs, or can we just look towards putting in more of those positive pressure fans on the HVAC systems? No, that's a good question, Kenny. Um, so the, the, what he's asking, an HRV, if, if you read through that ASHRAE standard, you'll find that they have actually they have a very prescriptive way that you must measure how much flow you have through an HRV. And it's pretty simple, but in theory, it's difficult in practice. Uh, on an HRV, you have to measure the intake and the exhaust. You add those two numbers together and then divide them by two. Basically, you're supposed to take the average between the intake and the exhaust. And if you've ever measured that on an HRV, most of you just have your, uh, your flow meter, the, the big black box from the energy conservatory, and that only measures exhaust. It's a, that's a one-way flow meter. In order to measure the intake, um, you can take that flow meter outside and put it over the intake in some situations. And because just remember, all that's doing is it's measuring flow in one direction. It's measuring it uh, through the opening in, in the box and then up into the fan. Well, if you can measure the flow the same way outside, in some instances, you can do that with that flow meter. In a lot of instances, you can't just due to siding or due to the, 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 the way the HRV is designed. Um, and it does require a different tool. The best tool I found for it is the, um, it's, I think it's like the ASIN flow finder or something. Let me see if I can look it up. Hey, Turner, we've also been using the Testo anemometer. Uh, it, you like, it's just a wand you put in the duct and it measures the pressure, it converts it to PFM. Measures, you, you got it on your app, you tell it what size of the diameter is and everything and the, yeah. and it does all the calculations for you, but that way you can get both um, intake and exhaust pretty easily. Nice, yeah, and that's, um, on any of the time you're just using an, uh, I can't say that word, an, 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 anometer. Anemometer. And yeah, but the, whenever you're using those, you do have to make sure that you measure the area of the of the opening, right? Is that, but you say there's yeah. an app where it, it kind well, of guides you through that? Well, ours is a Bluetooth one. Um, it pulls up the app on your phone and you just put in like, like I said, the duct dimensions and everything that you're measuring. Um, and then it just kind of does all the rest for you. Nice. Um, I'm just going to drop a link in the chat here. That's a link to RetroTech sells this tool. It's uh, it's the most accurate one out there, but it's probably thirty-two or thirty-five hundred dollars. So, if your agency is installing a lot of them, this one's nice and easy. This one's cool because you literally push one button, and it doesn't matter which direction the air is moving. But it's expensive, so invest in it if you're doing a lot of these. If not, I I 
I do prefer what Jesse just talked about using something. How much was that product that you guys were using, Jesse? About 150 bucks. Yeah. So, and there's, there's a bunch of different brands out there. You can do a little research on, you know, which one people have found to be more accurate. I know, um, gosh, what's his name? He wrote our, he wrote the book that we all read. What is it? Corbett Lunsford. Yeah. He, he did a video where he kind of compared, um, uh, eight or 10 different methods for measuring flow. So, um, and kind of showed the accuracy of each of those methods. So there's, there's something like that on YouTube might help you guys, but, um, but yeah, it, it, to measure the flow on an HRV, you have to measure the intake and the exhaust and take the average. I've seen a handful of, of homes where will uh, you measure the intake and it's at like 30 and then you measure the exhaust and it's only at 20. And so don't, don't be fooled thinking, oh, we have 30 CFM of, of air because when you follow the ASHRAE standard, you really only have the average of 30 and 20, which is you really only have 25. So um, the other thing is that the Panasonic, what's the name of that little HRV that we've been putting in in some homes that by Panasonic, it only moves like 20 to 40 CFM. 40 if you're lucky. Yeah, and and my my point here is is that that there is a little Panasonic HRV that that the program has used in a number of situations. Be careful, auditors. That thing does it. It hardly ever even gets to forty. We've seen a couple instances where it goes a little bit higher, but most of the time you're only going to get twenty to thirty CFM there. So un unless uh, that's unless you are very certain that's all that you need in that situation you should be looking for a larger HRV. So, Kenny, did that answer your question, man? Yeah, maybe, like I said, a real training show us this or send out that uh, thing that Lunsford did and see, because, I mean, I'm like, is it more accurate testing it outside on the hood or is it more accurate somehow trying to test it on the inside of the home? Oh, I got Because gotcha. we did the... On one of the videos I watched, you know, we did it before a port on the intake, before and after the filter, and on the exhaust before and after. I'm like, after we install those small ERVs, how am I going to drill a hole into to get a hose on both sides on the intake and exhaust to do what he's doing on those smaller ERVs? Because, gotcha. like I said, I don't know which way is more accurate. Like you say, there's a couple that you said it in yourself, he shows a couple different ways. So how do we know which one's the more accurate way? Yeah. Okay. No, I that that's a that's a great ask. I I think that could be fun if we were to do something maybe in our spring training where we actually sh set some stuff up and and show how to measure the flow on some of these things. So thank you for that. All right. Um. Will you go to the next slide, Rogers? Yes. Were, were there any other questions on that slide? All right. Um, so no other questions, but sorry, Turner. Um, okay. Kyle looked up the cost for the ASHRAE standard. It's over a hundred dollars to download it. Okay, but yeah, still, that's that's a perfectly reasonable cost for you guys to have a copy of the standard at your agencies. So yeah, I put the link. I'm putting the link in the chat to that specific standard, the sixty-two point one twenty sixteen. Just so you guys can see it. Thank you. Yeah, that that looks like the correct URL there. So thank you for finding that. So this is a slide I've, I've showed uh, in this meeting the last few years. I was a little sad to show it this year. Last year it had more green on it. This year it has a little more red on it. Um, I've just been, anytime we have an area of focus, I've been trying to measure whether or not our training and whether or not our efforts to improve in these areas is having an effect. And uh, I basically, I looked at the, the top 10 areas of focus that, I, that we were focusing on last year. 
and those are all listed here. If, and, and then the numbers over on the left-hand side, the one, four, five, and three, those are actually this year's uh, top five. You'll notice that number two is not on this list, but number one, four, five, and three are. So that's just kind of as a point of reference, we'll be, we'll be focusing on those items that are on this list. But, but really, this is a look back to say, did our training efforts, did the extra attention that we gave this on the monitoring pay off or not? Uh, and and in some areas it did. So, you know, on that second item down, were itemized costs allowable per the guideline? That was something I was watching closely and, and we made some major strides there. Uh, our HVAC evaluations, we we ticked up a little bit. We got a 4% improvement. So thank you for your efforts, but that's why it is still on the list because we've got a ways to go and we need to make sure we're getting that right. Uh, the shell, this uh, particularly in last year, it was I was kind of focused on attics and foundations because that's where we saw the most errors, but we, we did see a 5% improvement in that area this year. So Again, thank you for your accuracy and, and your efforts there. Uh, duct evaluation, we ticked up a little bit. That's an area as well that um, duct leakage evaluation, that's an area as well where you'll probably see additional training. We'd like to, it's not on my top five, but I think it made top six or seven. So we're going to work a little bit on that this year as well. Uh, and some of the red, like on item number five, is is there a written infiltration reduction strategy? We might have ticked down a little bit because I personally, as the monitor, was focused on, okay, the program's doing pretty good. Now I want to I want to start watching. Are we actually using our uh, our uh, zonals and and making sure that we're incorporating them into our air sealing strategy? So. We might have ticked down a little bit just because I had focused a little bit more on that than I had in the past as a monitor. But uh, anyway, that's kind of where we're at. It looks like we had some decent improvement in about half of the things that we were focused on, but we did see a little decline in some of the areas. Um, please be careful. I, I know it's this is easy for me to say and it's much harder to actually do, but do all that you can to not give up any of the ground that you gain. If you guys you guys spend a bunch of time improving some things in some areas, just maintain those good habits. Don't don't uh, don't lose that ground, and and we'll see a little more green on this as we go forward. And but this is also a good report card for us at the state, so we can look and say, hey, what can we do to maybe we didn't train this very well, or maybe we need to take a different approach to to help with this so we'll, we'll be doing a little bit of that as well um i had two other slides any questions on this one before i go to the next slide all right the next two slides are just a reminder that um so rogers and i we went out and did a bunch of monitoring last year and we we share our monitoring tool with each of you. So if you're wondering how you're getting graded, it's on the resources page. Uh, this is a, the, the list may not look exactly like this on the left-hand side, but if you go to the resources page, you get to the neat audit section, somewhere close to the bottom, it says energy audit monitoring checklist. That is, that's the same tool that I use when I go out and do my monitoring. So. If you're not doing it every time, I recommend that from time to time that you lay this next to one of your audits and check yourself and make sure that you're remembering to do everything. Um, I, the, uh, the monitoring tool may change a little bit in the coming weeks or months. Uh, if we change that before we get out and start our monitoring, we will send you guys a notification and, and a reminder to, hey, you know, we, we made a couple of adjustments to the monitoring tool we'll be using for this year. So, you know, make sure and grab a copy of it and uh, check your work before we get there. So any questions on that? 
cool. Well, that's all I had. Roger, do you have anything else on the monitor and stuff? Yeah, this was just kind of a, a, a closer look at it. I, I've tried to highlight a few things in red on the monitoring tool if it helps. So something to watch for. But. I didn't have really anything to add uh, other than the monitoring tool changes are going to be more of a format. But it's minor. It's, it's still going to be asking the same questions. We're still going to be looking at the same things. Yeah, that's we as we looked at this, I we don't anticipate any new items getting added to the list there. So but if if we missed something and we add something, then we'll we'll try to clarify that when you know we put out any adjusted monitoring tool. So excellent. Well, thank you guys. Uh thank you guys for all that you're doing. Um it's been interesting. I with Brad leaving, I've been looking at production numbers and things like that that I haven't looked at in a number of years. And it's just, it's been a good reminder of just how hard each of you work uh, and all that you guys do to make this program what it is. So thank you for all that you're doing. Please keep it up and, you know, keep in touch with us. Let us know what we can do to help you guys out. So thank you very much. Let's go ahead and end.